So we're gonna we're gonna go to our keynote this morning. Our keynote is Dr. Sean Genright. Uh, he's a leading uh, national expert of African American youth, youth activism, and youth development. And I told him I wasn't gonna go through his whole thing here. But the thing I will say, we found him on YouTube. I didn't find him. One of my co young colleagues found him on YouTube and says, why don't you consider him? And I watched his video on YouTube and I said, maybe we should consider him. Because one of the <laughs> things that I found very impressive uh, in looking around the country, he was talking about emotional health. He was talking about helping young people address their trauma. He was talking about helping them understand how that trauma might affect choices and, and their beliefs and things they could do and how to move that out of the way so they could be more, move forward and be more successful. And so I want to present to you, again, Dr. Sean Genright. Good morning. I, um, I always say that it is a, it's not a small world, it's a big family. It is a blessing and an honor for me to be here. Um, as I said last night at, at the reception, I'm from the sovereign and independent nation of Oakland, California. And uh, if, you're Cle if there's anybody from Cleveland up here, that's okay. You just beat the Warriors. Um, it's an honor for me to be here to uh, share some ideas with you about what I think is probably one of the most significant moments in American history <clears throat> um, in working with young people. And um, I was just at probably over the last uh, seven days, I've had um, at least two conferences or meetings where people are deeply concerned with the healing and the trauma that many young people, and for that matter, for African American adults are, are experiencing in schools and communities. And so I want to share with you today some ideas. I've, I've, uh, I'm a professor of African American Studies and Education at San Francisco State University. And in my studies and working with young people, I've also, uh, for the past 25 years, worked um, deeply in communities in Oakland, really trying to, I created an organization that supports young people, not simply with academic achievement, but restructuring their sense of hope and possibility. And that is, uh, many young people in the very uh, toxic communities in which they live, uh, what I find is that it's not just sort of academic achievement, that there's something more fundamental happening in their lives and in their, in, their, and in their homes. And so in the work that I've done over the past 25 years, small community-based organization has developed a model and a way to support young people, a way to support their teachers, and a way to support their families who all have been exposed to trauma and, and without addressing the entire ecosystem of trauma in our communities, sometimes we only miss that we only address a part of the equation. I want to start off with um, uh, a story that, um, that I think captures the complexity but also the beauty of the challenge that we face in America in relationship to trauma and healing. And I should say that oftentimes we focus on trauma, but trauma is just the condition. Healing is the pathway, but well-being is the outcome. And so if we focus only on trauma, sometimes we just simply ease the trauma that we experience. If we focus on healing, we get stuck on the freeway and the pathway. But if we focus on well-being, thriving and flourishing, then we seek that destination that we want our young people and, on our, our, and their parents and our adults to achieve. So I say that because oftentimes in, in circles with policymakers, we get stuck with the language. And sometimes the language keeps us in a, reproduces the same things we're trying to solve. About four years ago, um, I was asked to come and speak um, at some, a place that I had never spoken before. I usually I speak at universities or conferences in some ways that are dealing with issues with, related to young people. But this was an odd request from a prison not far from my home. The request was, Dr. Genright, can you come out to the prison? There's 10, 10 inmates here who 
had uh, gotten a hold of my earlier book called Black Youth Rising. They really want to, they read your book and they'd love to, for you to come out. So I came out, I was deciding whether or not I would come out to the prison. And so I decided to, to go to the prison to talk to these 10 men. And I went to the prison and uh, they met me at the gate. The correctional officers met me at the gate. And they said, uh, we need to see your ID. And we need you to follow the instructions as you walk to the cafeteria where the 10 men are. So they said, show me your ID. I gave them the ID. And the first correctional officer said, OK, uh, follow the yellow line to the end of the corridor. And, this, and I, followed, I followed the yellow line. I, and I heard the door shut behind me, boom. And I followed the yellow line all the way to the end of the corridor. And when I got to the next door, there was a correctional officer there meeting me, who met me. And they buzzed the door open. Bzzz, and I walked through the door. The correctional officer said, turn left, follow the blue line all the way in to the end of the corridor. Boom. The door shut behind me, and I followed the blue line all the way to the end of the corridor. And as I got to the end of that corridor, there was another correctional officer who met me there. The door buzzed open. Bzzz, and this correctional officer said, uh, to get to the cafeteria, you need to follow the green line straight ahead to the end of the corridor. And the door shut behind me. Boom. But by this time, the third door that shut behind me, I got a chill. Right? I actually got this, I felt the sense of incarceration. I began to feel the enclosement of what it must be like to live and work in a prison. And I immediately began to think to myself, what can I tell these men? What research, what work can I talk about these, uh, to men who had been incarcerated? and I became incredibly insecure. Right. I got to the end of the corridor, and they led me to the cafeteria where I had expected 10 men to be waiting for me. And to my surprise and my shock, as, I, as a correctional officer opened the door to the cafeteria, there were 200 men there wait, waiting for me. And I was overwhelmed. And as I walked into the door, they were like, hey, Dr. G, man, we're so glad you're here. I'm like, I'm glad I'm here as well. Really looking forward to sharing some ideas with you, brothers. And they were shaking my hands. And one brother came up to me. His name was Tony. He said, Dr. G, we're glad you're here, man. I'm like, man, I'm glad to be here. He said, my name is Tony. I've been here since 1985, man. I said, wow, 1985. When he said that, it hit me, right? Another brother came up to me. His name was Chris, short brother, came up to me. He said, Dr. G, man, um, I read your book, man. I'm, I'm glad you're going to share some ideas with us. I've been in here since 1987. And one by one, these brothers began to share with me, not what they did, but how long they had been incarcerated. You see, I, didn't, I wasn't aware that these men were doing life sentences, right? that they weren't likely to hug their daughters, hug their sons, smell the, fr the fresh fragrance of rain on the asphalt, feel the warm sun on their face anytime soon. And so as I prepared the, my talk, I took the talk that I had prepared, my notes, I crumbled it up, and I threw them away. Because I believe there's nothing that I could have shared with them from my own academic position to move them in any way. And as they ushered me up to the podium, I had no idea what I was going to say. And I got behind the podium. And I was silent, insecure, and just began to tell them my story of being raised in Jacksonville, Florida, in the South. And I began to share with them my concerns about raising my seven-year-old son and my daughter. And I began to share with them my life. Right? And one of the things I said to them as I, um, as I was talking is that you are not whatever you did. You are not whatever you did. And to release whatever guilt, shame, and insecurity you have around that is really your freedom and liberation. And even in a place like this, there's possibilities for you. And I began to talk and talk. And I don't remember every, anything else I said. But I, fin I finished the talk, and they all came up to me. Hey, man, we're really glad you shared those ideas. It was really helpful for us. Right? I signed some books. And then the correctional officers said, hey, man, it's time to leave. Dr. Jen Wright, it's time to leave. And so as I was leaving the auditorium saying bye to the brothers, 
I heard a voice behind me as I was walking out the door. Hey, Dr. G. I'm like, damn, <laughs> who's that? And as I turned around, there was a tall brother. I'm not exaggerating. He must have been seven feet tall, 300 pounds. He was huge. I said, hey, brother, how you doing, man? He said, I'm doing good, man. I want to let you know the words that you shared really touched me. I said, no, I'm glad they touched you. He said, no, you really touched me, brother. You really got to me. I really want to know you inspired me. I'm like, I'm so glad that that happened. And he said, you see this scar on my face? And he leaned down. And uh, he had a scar on his face. He said, see, everybody in here thinks I'm tough because I'm so tall. They think I'm mean. They think I have a, they think I don't feel, man. They don't think I care. They think I'm, you know, they think because I'm big and I'm black that I'm something else. And I got this scar because a couple of years ago they cut me in here, man. And it's difficult to keep a sense of peace of mind in a place like this, brother. And I said, I'm sorry to hear that, man. And so he, um, he said, but there is something that I do to keep a sense of hope in my life because I got to heal every day. I have to heal and I have to make healing a part of my process. So he reached into his pocket and I was like, oh shit, what's this brother? <laughs> Is he reaching in his pocket? I looked at, I looked at the correctional officers. They was like, it's okay. <laughs> and as he reached into his pocket, he pulled out a little bottle. And he opened the bottle and he blew bubbles. The bubbles floated over my head, and the first thought that I had was, did this big brother just blow bubbles in my face? <laughs> and he said to me, he said, man, when I blow bubbles, it reminds me of my childhood. It reminds me of when I was whole. It reminds me of being whole again and, and healthy. Mine it keeps my sense of peace. And as he, those bubbles floated over me, I also start to realize that despite the conditions of this prison, there are spaces of hope and healing that are possible. And as I left the prison, I began to become very curious about how is it that people in chocolate cities around the country where there's difficult situations create a sense of hope and healing for young people and for themselves? What kind of bubble stories do you have? What kind of bubble stories do we share with each other to create a sense of peace and possibility and hope for ourselves and for the young people in which we work? My curiosity led me to write this book called Hope and Healing in Urban Education. And in the book, what I try to do is find the ways in which schools, community-based organizations, city governments, um, mom and pop churches, create a sense of possibility and hope for young people in very difficult situations. These possibilities are not simply led by a great idea. But what I found is that the most profound bubble stories, the, f the most profound spaces of hope are not from an idea, but people are leading from their hearts. They're willing to take courageous risk to try things differently. I'm going to share with you a couple of case stories. One of the case stories is a, a, young, a man in Richmond, California was able to reduce gun violence because he said, I love you to men who, young men who carry, who carry guns and shoot each other. It actually became a part of public policy in Richmond. So it is through stories and case studies and through the research that I developed an idea called radical healing. Right? And that radical healing is a way in which we can transform our own lives, heal ourselves in the process of bringing that healing into the institutions in which we work. But there are threats to hope and healing. There are challenges to hope and healing, right? We could say we want hope and healing. We could try to engage in strategies of hope and healing. But without an understanding of the threats to it, then sometimes we spin our wheels. I was sharing this idea with my son about hope and healing, and he's, he, um, he referred me to this album. Y'all know who Kendrick Lamar is. And in the album, Kendrick Lamar uh, was a hip-hop artist. He said, uh, he said, I'm a good kid in this album. I just live in a mad city. I'm a good kid, but sometimes I have to navigate 
the Crips and the Bloods. I'm a good kid, but sometimes when I want to go out, I have to make decisions about the police so they don't hem me up. I have to, I'm a good kid in a mad city. I'm a good kid trying to do well, but the city and the environment in which I live sometimes makes my goodness difficult. What Kendrick Lamar said is the same thing research suggests, right? James Gabarino, in a book called Raising Children in a Socially Toxic Environment, said the same thing that Kendrick Lamar said. He calls it social toxicity, and James Gabarino says that just like there are physical toxins, like asbestos and lead paint, if you have asbestos and lead paint in your apartment, in your school or your building, eventually you'll be sick. And if you're not healed from that physical toxicity, it can become lethal. Well, James Gabarino said that just like there are physical toxins, there are social equivalents. What is a social equivalent? A social equivalent is fear, anxiety, distrust, stress, shame. All of these things exist in the environment as a result of racism, as, exists, as a result of poverty. But Gabarino says that social toxicity is more insidious, it's more dangerous than physical toxins. And he says it's more dangerous because you can see physical toxins. You can measure them. But it's difficult to go into a neighborhood, a community, or a school and measure fear, to measure anxiety, to understand the levels and the complexities of stress that young people and the adults have in a school or environment. James Farmer, uh, 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 Paul Farmer, uh, says it in a different way. He calls it structural violence. And, in, and similarly, the reason I like the term that he used, structural violence, is that oftentimes we think about inequality or we think about the structures of our society as simply limiting opportunities. But structural violence suggests that, that the structures, the laws and policies in our society don't simply block opportunities, but they cause harm, right? One of the things that I say to my graduate students often is that oftentimes when we talk about inequality and structural racism and poverty, that the single greatest casualty of these of, of racism and poverty and structural issues is not simply blocked opportunities. The greatest casualty is our inability to dream beyond it. That these conditions shape the way in which we see our world and as a result cannot see beyond the ways in which we need to transform our schools, our community-based organizations to create opportunities to saturate a community with healing opportunities, to saturate a school with healing opportunities. Paul Farmer says that without addressing structural violence, we reproduce it. You might remember in Springfield or Spring Valley High School in uh, South Carolina, where a young girl was on her phone, cell phone in the classroom, the teacher said, you need to put your phone away. And the, the student refused to put her phone away. She called in the principal, and the principal couldn't get the student to put her phone away. And therefore, the principal called the police to come and asked this young lady to put her phone away. But this time, she refused to put her phone away. And as a result, the police officer came up to her, you should watch the video, flipped her over the desk, drug her out, as she, if she was an animal, in front of the other students who were videotaping it. Now, the most uh, crazy part of this scenario is actually not that it happened. But as I heard it on CNN and NBC, one of the newscasters said, well, we don't know what she did to deserve that. Now, just asking the question, well, what should, did she do to deserve it? Just asking the question indicts the child. That's structural violence. As opposed to looking at what would allow a grown police officer to treat a child like an animal, right? Who, how can that be allowed? So what we, 
what we need to understand is that structural violence, social toxicity is embedded in our schools, sometimes it's embedded in our community organizations, and if we're not aware of it, sometimes we reproduce it. This is another example, St. Petersburg, Florida. About four years ago, a child was crying. She had a temper tantrum, man. She's seven years old. She wanted to go home. And um, rather than calming her down, they, again, they called in the police. You could see the trauma on her face, right? So trauma is not just one acute act. Right? One of the things I'd want you to leave with today is that you avoid, as much as possible, using the term post-traumatic stress disorder. Don't use it anymore. Because it is an inaccurate term to the conditions that our young people and that we face in urban America. First, there's nothing post about trauma. It is persistent. Right? It is a persistent, that means that this child experienced trauma at seven, she'll probably experience it again at 10, she'll watch something happen to her mother or father at 11 or 12, and, then she, and so on and so forth. It is persistent, right? Also, uh, we, when we use uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, it is not a disorder. It is actually an accurate response to a crazy situation, right? So when we call it a disorder, we've, we focus on the individual when in fact it is the environment. I use the term persistent traumatic stress environment. That, therefore, everyone is indicted, not just the young people, not just the teachers, but the adults who work with them as well. Persistent traumatic stress environment forces us to ask the question, not why did the girl get on the damn phone, but what are the conditions that created the police officer to treat her that way? What's happening in the environment that allows for these young people to be stressed out? We have to look, we have to shift our language if we want to look at the barriers to healing. In Oakland, where I'm from, just like chocolate cities throughout America, we have issues that make it difficult for young people to learn and for young people to excel. This is a map of Oakland. Um, and every year, the Oakland Tribune publishes in the newspaper um, a map of, of all of the homicides that happen in the city. This is an old map, but it's still, unfortunately, um, if, when, we do the, when they do the map this year, will uh, show the similar kind of results. So this is, in, a, in 2002, there are 113 homicides in Oakland, and you can see that they're spread throughout Oakland. Oakland is divided by, I don't know if this is a pointer or not, is this a point? Oakland is divided by what's called the hills and the flatlands. This freeway right here divides Oakland. The hills are the upper middle class wealthy part of the city. The flatlands right here are working poor parts of, part of the city. And so you'll see where, as we map this, where most of these homicides occur. 2003 is 114 homicides. You can, again, note where these are occurring. In 2004, 88. 2005, um, 146, right? I'm sorry, 2006, 146, right? Really difficult year. And then every year they, they provide a, a, a picture in the newspaper of all of the people to, uh, and their names, right? We say their names so that they're not just statistics. But if we look at the five-year total, right? If you look at the five-year total, what we see here is a community, a city that's saturated by homicides. The question becomes, if we are trying to support young people, how is it that schools, community-based organizations, mental health professionals, public policy, public health, dealing with that. How are we supporting young people with dealing with the trauma of exposure to homicides? I've been to New York, I've been to the Bronx, I've been to Chicago, I've been to um, Miami, I've been to a number of places across the country talking both with young people and the adults. And I could ask the question, 
how many of the, if this was a group of young people, how many of you um, have experienced loss of, of a loved one or a friend from, by homicide or gun violence? And nearly all of them will raise their hand. Now, it's, it's odd that, however, they rare, very rarely have conversations about this in their schools, in their classrooms, right? So where do they process? Who do they talk to about, I'm sad that I lost my friend? Where do they talk to, I'm scared that I might be next? Who do they talk to about, I'm afraid to walk? Where does that go, right? It gets bottled in. It gets shaped in. And when it gets bottled in, it creates other kinds of mental health issues and challenges. It creates hopelessness, a sense that there's no control over one's life. And hopelessness is a predictor, the research suggests, it's a predictor of violent behavior, it's a predictor of fatalism, it's a predictor of depression, it's a, de de uh, it's a predictor of drug use, it's a predictor of a number of the kinds of issues that we see show up in our schools and neighborhoods. So the question is, is that how do we get to the root, right, to, to foster a pathway to healing, we first have to deal with hope, right? Hope is the most, in, uh, the most significant ingredient in, in creating a pathway to well-being. So how do community organizers, community workers, and teachers respond to this issue, and where do they learn to support young people with what I call existential questions? Who am I? Where am I going? What is my life about? Why did this happen? These are existential questions, right? That oftentimes we as adults are not equipped to answer ourselves or support young people to answer them quest those questions as well. It is the psycho-spiritual harm that's caused by trauma that makes it difficult for adults to have these conversations. We just came out of a retreat last week with teachers and from all over the country to learn to heal themselves around their own trauma, right? We bring, if we're not in a, in a pathway to well-being as adults, guess what? We bring the shame for the thick lips into the classroom. We bring the shame of the kinky hair into the classroom. We bring the, the whatever it is we have, the, the violence that we had in our childhood, whatever it has in experience as adults, we've got it too, y'all. And if we're not explicitly engaged in healing what harms us, it ultimately gets showed up when it shows up in the classrooms or our community-based organizations. So in our work, we went deep with these folks to talk about what's going on in your life. What shame do you have? What did your daddy do to you? We went there. That's how serious it is. Because I don't believe you should be in the front working with young people, right? if you are not in a process of your own well-being. We cannot presume that because you're an adult, you are okay. That's a false assumption, right? Adulthood is not a final product, right? We are still being made and remade every day. And sometimes we believe that now that I got a job and a degree and a stable household, I'm cool. Just put me in front of a young person to mentor them. Not, not, that's, not, that's not how it works. Right? So we, we're, we're, we've tried to do is build this model to suggest that, that we have to foster and think about hope for our young people and think about hope for the adults who work with them. So what is hope then? And how do we get on this pathway to hope? Snyder has, um, um, I think, an interesting theory about hope and how we engage in hope for young people. And it's called hope theory. And he says it's really basic. It's three ingredients to healing and hope. And the first thing is a future goal orientation. How do you begin to think about the future beyond tomorrow, right? How is it that we support young people with thinking beyond their present conditions? So the future goal orientation is not just career training. It's not just what kind of job one I want to get. It's who do you want to be as an adult, right? The second are pathways. So how do we get the opportunities and the strategies and pathways toward that future goal orientation so that young people can actually have that opportunity? And then third, a sense of agency, the belief that they can actually do it. 
Snyder suggests that if any one of those three ingredients are missing from our, our practices and strategies, that the chair falls down, right? That is, you can have a goal, you can have future goal orientation, and you can have agency, the belief that you can achieve it, but without the pathway, one be can become hopeless. Or you can have pathway and agency, but without a reflection on where you're gonna be in the future, the chair falls down, one can become hopeless. So all three need to be in, in present in our environments and our strategies to sustain young people with a sense of hope. A colleague of mine, Jeff Duncan Andrade, wrote in a book or um, in an article that was published in the Harvard Ed Review, he provides us with three types of hope, and I want to focus on the third form of hope. And he says, he calls it audacious hope. And he says that audacious hope is healing from oppression in order to transform it. So it doesn't mean that healing is some individual medical therapeutic process, right? It suggests if I'm sick, we sick. If I'm well, we well, right? Which is a different way of thinking about well-being from, it shifts it from an individual standpoint to a collective condition, right? We cannot separate one's well-being from the community from which that person exists. So youth development and civic engagement strategies designed to engage America's most disconnected young people will only be successful to the extent that they address hopelessness. So we have to think about hopelessness as a key strategy into fostering healing from trauma and healing toward a sense of well-being. So what types of conditions then foster a sense of hope and healing? How do we actually create hope and healing opportunities in our programs, our schools, our community-based organizations? Well, the first thing is we have to understand what happens when we experience trauma. Virginia O'Leary says that trauma occurs all the time to adults and to young people. And she says that, you know, if you think of this, this line here as a normal level of functioning, that this is where y'all, this is where I am, this is where we all are right now. We can get up and we go to work and we, we can do, we can function, we go to, you know, uh, work with our friends. But sometimes something happens. We experience some, so, some form of social trauma and our ability to function declines. That social trauma could be, I lost a loved one. My mama just passed away. I lost a job. I just got divorced. My kids are tripping, right? Y'all yeah, are supposed to laugh at that one, right? <laughs> right. right. So there, there are a number of things that can create a form of social trauma, right? We've all experienced the time when something happened and we just couldn't function anymore. And she says that there are three options when we experience a form of social trauma. The first option is survival, right? And survival is we just, man, I just want to get through today. If I could just get through the week, I'm going to be okay, right? It's just day to day making it through. And then sometimes we could get support from our loved ones. We can get support from um, the, the community organizations or our churches and our family. And we can move from survival to the second, which is called recovery. And recovery is, I'm going to be all right. I'm back to the level of functioning that I was prior to the trauma. That means I can, you know, I'm supported. I can go, I can get, go back to work. I could um, have conversations with my friends and loved ones that my normal level of functioning is back. But the third level of functioning, she says, sometimes we can get supported in such a way that we have a third option, which she calls thriving. And thriving means that because the trauma happened, we are stronger, more resilient, more insightful, more hopeful than we were prior to the social trauma. That means now we are operating at a higher level where we could take what we experienced, learn from it, and share it with other folks. So if you think about mothers against drunk driving, right? Mothers who've lost their children, there's um, trauma that happened. Now they're able, from that experience, to build policy and practices around the country that reduce drunk driving um, instances in neighborhoods and communities. So, so thriving is what we should be aspiring for. Not survival, not recovery, but thriving in our schools and our neighborhoods. 
I was sharing this idea with a friend of mine about thriving. Like, how do we build thriving strategies? And she's actually a botanist at UC Berkeley. And she said, um, well, you know, it's interesting that you talk about that. We do these experiments. It's amazing how she was able to take this idea and put it into her work, right? She said, we, take, we do these experiments as a, as a botanist. We take these plants, and you were talking about social toxicity. Well, we actually use, we put, them, we put these plants in a, in a chamber, a gas chamber, and we pump the, the chamber with gas. And we try to measure how long it takes for the plant to die, right? Some plants are more resilient, it takes longer. And so one time, you know, we were trying to study these plants, but one time what we did is we took a bunch of plants and we put a bunch of plants in that same chamber. We brought them together. And we put them in the chamber and we pumped in the chamber with gas. We wanted to see what the plants did and something really miraculous happened as we pumped it with gas. The plants began to pull out of the soil different nutrients. And the plants, as a, as a community, began to metabolize those nutrients, and they began to emit a gas in the chamber that cleaned up the toxic gas we were pumping in it. Right? They detoxified their environment to stay alive and to thrive. And I thought that was a, an amazing metaphor for the kind of strategies we want in our schools and communities. How do we build environments that detoxify, right? Detoxify schools and environments that make healing and hope possible for young people and for ourselves. I call that process radical healing. And radical healing is not just therapeutic healing of the individual. Radical healing is focusing on possibilities of hope that create greater opportunities for healing and well-being for disconnected young people. I want to share with you three brief case stories that I think are great illustrations of a radical healing. There are three components. There's re relational hope, restorative hope, and political hope. Relational hope is the kind of hope that builds courageous, profound relationships with those that we believed are unlovable, right? like the brothers who carry guns and shoot at each other. In Richmond, California, a man, a young man, a man by the name of Devon Bogan, who's a friend of mine, was hired, um, was approached by the city of Richmond. Richmond is a very small neighborhood, but it had the lion's share of homicides in the entire Bay Area. Young, young kids, 13, 14, 15 years old, were sh shooting each other and killing each other. The city of Richmond were hiring police officers at the tune of about $250,000 per year, and it had done nothing to reduce gun violence in the neighborhood. They approached Devon Bogan, who's, who was a longtime youth development worker in, uh, in the area, and they said, can you help us? And Devon um, realized, he had just realized that if you, if you he went to a, a, a seminar and he, he studied, and he realized that in any neighborhood, where there is gun violence, say there's, there's, they say there's 50 homicides in any neighborhood. There's probably 10 young people responsible for those 50 homicides. It's not like all the kids are shooting each other. It might be a, it's a small group of them. And so when he realized that, he said, we could actually do something with 15 or 20 young people. And so they went, he went back to the city and said, here's what I think we should do. It's gonna sound crazy, y'all. We should hire ex-convicts who just got released out of prison, use tax dollars to pay them a salary, to hang out on the corners with young people who carry guns. That's what he said to them, and they laughed him out of there. Man, get, your, get out of here. You crazy? Use tax dollars to pay ex-cons to sit on a corner to talk with young people who carry guns? That don't make sense, right? But they didn't have anything, they didn't have a choice, right? <laughs> they didn't have a choice. So he said, just try it and let's see what happens. The first person they hired was, was this brother here, Sam, right? And Sam had just done 15 years in prison. And one of the things Sam, the asset Sam brought back to Richmond is that he knows everybody in the community, including your mama, your grandmama, and your brother's cousin. He, he has an amazing ability to ask you, what's your last name? Oh, Simmons? Oh, you so-and-so's folks, huh? 
Yeah, I used to hang out with your, he, was, he would do that with anybody in the community. He was able to provide a mapping of who you are and who, you belong, who your people is, right? Who your people is. Now, that might seem funny, but what he's able to do with that, just by asking who, who your people is, he's able to establish a connection. So I spent some time with Sam, and we rode around. There was a shooting, there was a shooting on a Sunday before, so on Tuesday, we were riding around the neighborhood, and he found a group of young men standing on the corner, smoking weed. They were 13, 14, 15 years old, right? And we pulled up, and he said, let me go talk to these young men. And I said, okay, let me, and I got out. He said, no, man, you need to stay here, because they got guns. And I was like, cool. I'll stay right here while you go handle that, man. So he went and talked to them. They had guns, right? And after a few minutes, he said, Dr. G, you can come out, man. They're cool. They're not going, right? So I said, you sure? Right? Um, so he went and talked to them. And what I heard him say was amazing, right? He said to them things like, um, look, man, I took some bread over your mama's house the other day because I know she was, y'all needed some sandwiches, right? And look, uh, to the next brother, he said, I know you were trying to buy some cleats for your baby cousin for the football, look man, I got some cleats in my trunk, let's see if they'll fit him. And uh, look man, I know that you was talking about getting that job. He was able to provide something that those young men wanted, right? And it wasn't as a official city official, it was more like an uncle, right? It was more like a cousin, right? And he was able to establish that. And as we walked away, I remember something he said, and I asked him about it. As we walked away, he turned his back and he turned back to the group of young men and he said, hey, y'all, hey, man, you know I love you, right? And that's, that surprised me. And, he, and they was like, yeah, man, we got love for you, too. And we, we got back in the car, and I asked him, I was like, you said, um, you know I love you, right? He said, yeah, we're trained to do that. I'm trained to do that, right? They may not hear it, but after a while, they actually believe it, not because I say it, because of what I do, because I show up at 1130 at night with them cleats, right? And he says, we don't tell them not to carry guns. That's why they got guns on them. Because he lived on the street. Now, this is, this is going to sound odd, y'all. Um, I don't usually say this in public, but this is, is in the book I wrote. He said, we don't usually tell them not to carry guns, because we know it's dangerous out here. They need to protect themselves. But what we do say is, if you're going to go use your gun, if you're going to go shoot somebody, y'all, call me first. That's what they say. Because for us to say, don't carry guns, we we develop an inauthentic relationship with them because that ain't real, man. So he said, if you're going to shoot somebody, call us first. Now, it sounds odd, but listen. He said, he said last week, some, the, a group of them had called because they were getting ready to ride up. They said, Sam, we're getting ready to go smoke these cats, man. We gonna, they shot up my cousin, man. We're getting ready to go smoke them. But they called him first. And he said, you guys going to do that? Okay, come by here first. Come by my office first. Let me meet you. So they came by, and they was drunk, and they was all hyphy. They was all, man, we're getting ready to do this. Sam was like, okay, I know y'all got to do, do that, but um, check it out. Let's go get some pizza first. <laughs> Sounds funny. And they were like, man, no, we, man, I am kind of hungry, man. I, now, wh what is this? They're 13, 14, 15-year-old children. Okay? These are not hard and grown men. They're children. So let's go get some pizza. So they go have pizza, and he talks them down. Right? Through relational hope, through, by providing a profound, courageous, unorthodox relationship, right? They were able to build out this office where now they have seven men like Sam who are out there creating love relationships with these young men. They just did a study of this program, and this is what they found. The program started in 2009 with about 45 homicides in the community. And just recently, last year, they did a study to find that there were below 15 homicides. Right? They reduced gun violence in that neighborhood. Right? Relational hope has a potential to create hope and healing or healing opportunities for young people where it's very difficult. If you can get a young person to put a gun down, through love relationships, you certainly can use love relationships to get a young person to pick up a book and a pencil. The second is restorative hope, right? How do we restore a sense 
of well-being, not in an individual sense, but as a collective. This is a neighborhood in, um, in San Francisco, California, called Bayview Hunters Point. A friend of mine runs an organization there. Her name is Elena Miller, called Hunters Point Family. This is just a picture of some kids burning the playground on a random, uh, random Saturday, right? They didn't have much, they don't have a lot to do. A lot of the city services had been removed. Um, Lena had an experience she came to me with that unfortunately some of you may have experienced. Unfortunately, she had been familiar with losing young children and adults to gun violence. But this time she lost one of the workers in her program, an adult. Young people walked, um, walked into this, um, the community center and shot up and killed one of the youth workers, an adult, right? She went into a deep depression. She couldn't do it anymore. And she decided that she needed to remove herself from the organization that she had founded. We were able to work with Lena for a while. And as she took some time off, she reimagined what her community needed. What they were doing mostly as after school programs, academic tutoring, uh, math, uh, uh, baseball, soccer. And she recognized that while that was important, it was grossly insufficient for what the community needed. She decided, after having watched and learned about the Harlem's Children's Zone, she said, what we need in San Francisco in this neighborhood is a healing zone. And not just individual therapeutic services, where I would go to the therapist and lay down and they tell me about their problems. But we want a healing zone that saturates the neighborhood with opportunities for healing. Well, what it, ask her what that looks like. She says, I want yoga studios in the housing projects. I want community gardens. I want, I want places for people to get massages. I want people to be able to have everything they have in the suburbs right here in Hunters Point. So we supported her with trying to understand that. And the first thing we did is we wanted to understand what is going on in San Francisco in terms of mental health. This is a picture of San Francisco. This area here, which says District 10, is Bayview Hunters Point. And you can see that the red represents the mental health need in San Francisco. The white dots represent where the funding and the dollars were being spent on mental health. Y'all see that? I'll say it again. The red represents the mental health need the white dots, rep and this is a map produced by the city, so we didn't do this. The white dots represents where the mental health dollars were being spent in San Francisco. So she organized and she began to talk about, um, she said our goal was to move the white dots um, into the infection, which is like the red area. So she organized parents, she organized young people, she organized the city to actually get, uh-oh, to get a, um, get the white dots moved into the area of infection. They were able to allocate the first year $2 million into creating yoga studios in the housing projects, right? They shifted their model of mental health because they were saying that people from Hunters Point needed to go downtown to get mental health services. And she shifted that, now the mental health services are actually occurring in, in, the, in the housing projects. And they have things like meditation, yoga, all the kinds of things that are necessary to saturate a community with mental health. The last is called political hope, right? And political hope is using a political imagination to change the conditions of young people in a neighborhood. This is an example of young people in Los Angeles um, organizing to get a piece of language removed out of a policy called willful defiance. Willful defiance was a piece of, was a, a language in, a, in the school district that allowed for a teacher to suspend a kid for whatever they believed they needed to be suspended for. You, if you're chewing gum in the classroom, oh, and yet they say, take the gum out. No, I'm not taking my gum out, Mrs. Smith. Oh, you're being willfully def defiant. I'm kicking you out. I asked you to take your hat off you're in the classroom. I don't want to take my hat off. Oh, I'm going to kick you out. You're being willfully defiant. It allowed for teachers to suspend or to get kick kids out of the classroom. It disproportionately impacted black and brown children, right? So they organized with adults to get this language removed out of Los Angeles uh, Unified School District. Um, and in 2013, uh, they were able to 
um, actually remove the language of willful defiance suspensions out of the um, out of the policy in Los Angeles schools. This took seven months of organizing with parents and adults and and all and a number of young people. And then in 2014, they were able to invest 4.2 million dollars in restorative practices. So now that they removed um, willful defiance, they're using restorative justice, which is, a, which is a process that allows for conflict resolution to be handled by young people in the existing schools, as opposed to harsher discipline policies. And then in 2015, the, the school district was going to spend $13 million um, uh, on additional police, but they were able to get $3 million of those $13 million to reinvest in restorative justice practices, thereby shifting resources into the schools that created greater opportunities to use restorative practices rather than harsh uh, penalties or harsh um, uh, policies that punish young people, right? So as we think about practices that build hope and healing, um, there are four or five that I want to leave with you to consider and think about in, your own, in our own work. And the first is, how do we articulate your vision of hope and healing, right? What does that vision of hope and healing look like? As I began, we have to think beyond trauma towards what it is we want to see. What does a healed community look like? Not a healed individual, a healed community. What does it look like? The second, for those of you who control budgets, right? We can say we want healing and hope but we have to place that against two things that you can measure anything of value of an individual, an institution, or even a nation. And that's where you spend your time and money, right? So map your budget, review your budget against time and money spent on hope and healing, right? If you say you're about hope and healing, but you recognize that 70% of your budget or 60% of your budget is spent on discipline, Right? Then, that's a di then you have to rethink about where your dollars are being spent. Hope and healing is not something that oftentimes will be brought, brought up. Some people are more resistant. Some people believe that harsh discipline policies are necessary. So you might want to, the third is to establish buy-in from a core group of committed individuals and stakeholders. Right? You may only get four or five or six people. Right? Um, Samira, and Sam are courageous leaders who are taking that step um, here and, and St. Paul, right? And so it may start with a small group of individuals to then create a larger movement about hope and healing. And then the third, or the fourth, is create an inventory of policies and practices that promote hope and healing in your organizations. What are the discipline policies? Do you have a policy where you actually encourage a hug when young people walk through the door? Or do you have policies that say, we can't touch young people, right? Because it, 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 it's, it's, it's a liability, okay? So we need to think about the policies that either inhibit or actually foster a sense of hope and healing, right? Um, I want to end with this, this quote, right? And the quote is by Dr. King, and he says that one of the greatest problems of history is that the concepts of love and power have been usually contrasted as opposites. And what is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. <laughs>